Good evening everybody. I declare the meeting open at three minutes past six. I'd like to start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Acting CEO, do we have some apologies this evening? Uh, yes, Mayor Cole. We have apologies from Councillor Josh Toppelberg, apologies from Councillor Jimmy Murphy and the Chief Executive Officer Len Kosova. Thank you, Acting CEO. I note that Councillor Ros Harley is also potentially running late, um, but I haven't had any confirmation of apologies at this stage. So we will go to public question time. Um, welcome to the members of the public gallery. Please um, do feel free to um, address Council on any matter on the agenda this evening. There's no set order. We do just ask that you state your name, your address and the item to which you are speaking. And we do time you to three minutes, um, so it would be appreciated if you're um, able to keep to that. We do have a few declarations of interest this evening, so please bear with us while the Acting CEO takes us through those. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, before I do start with the declarations of interest, I will just confirm that we've received a late apology from Councillor Harley. Uh, so I have received a disclosure of interests affecting a partiality from Councillor Jonathan Hallett uh, that relates to item 5.3, number 4587 Bulwer Street, Perth, proposed amendment to operating hours of previous approval, change of use from office to eating house. The extent of Councillor Hallett's interest is that he lives within the consultation area for the application. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Hallett's interest on the matter may be affected. Councillor Hallett has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I've also received a disclosure of interest affecting impartiality from Councillor Fatakis. Uh, that is in relation to item 5.4, number 34 Cleaver Street, West Perth, proposed four group dwellings. Councillor Fatakis has disclosed an association with the applicant, um, Mr Trent Deward, who was speaking tonight on behalf of the applicant, who is a member of the City of Vincent Business Advisory Group, of which Councillor Fatakis is a council representative on that group. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fatakis's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Fatakis has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I've received a disclosure of financial interest from Mayor Cole. Uh, that is in relation to matter 5.5, which is numbers 20 and 120 and 121 Summer Street, Perth, proposed four three-storey group dwellings. The extent of that interest is the applicant, Leslie Thomas, provided voluntary campaign assistance for Mayor Cole by leafleting during the February 2017 extraordinary election as registered in the gifts register. As a consequence, Councillor Cole is not seeking approval to participate in the debate or to remain in chambers or to vote on the matter. I've received a disclosure of interest affecting, uh, from a financial perspective, uh, from Councillor Castle. Uh, that is in relation to item 5.10, which is the outcomes of advertising the town centre place plans. Councillor Castle has disclosed that she has an association with the applicant, that association being that she is currently engaged by Mount Hawthorne Hub to provide graphic design services for the Streets and Lanes Festival. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Car Castle's interest on the matter may be affected. Councillor Castle has declared that she will consider that, uh, sorry, I, I correct myself. As a consequence, um, Councillor Castle is not requesting approval to participate in debate in relation to that matter. I've received a further disclosure of financial interest from Councillor Alex Castle in relation to item 12.1, that is the review of policy number 4.2.13, Design Advisory Committee and Appointment of Design Review Panel. Councillor Castle has declared an indirect financial relationship with one of the applicants, Manura Mackay, through her work for Mount Hawthorne Hub. Ms Mackay is a committee member of the Hub. As a consequence, Councillor Castle is not seeking approval to participate in debate or to remain in the chambers or to vote on the matter. And finally, I have a disclosure of interest affecting impartiality from Councillor Fatakis, also in relation to item 12.1. Councillor Fatakis has disclosed that she has an association 
with Simon Venturi, who is one of the applicants who also serves on the City's Arts Advisory Group, of which Councillor Fatakis is a council representative. Mr Venturi is also a member of Leadable Connect, of which Councillor Fatakis previously served as a member of the Management Committee. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fatakis's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Fatakis has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank you. That was a bit of a mouthful, Acting CEO. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for your patience um, while we went through our declarations of interest. Um, given that we've had some questions from the public gallery this evening on uh, three planning items, I'll go to those first for questions and answers between council members and administration so that if people wish to leave they don't feel that they need to remain. Um, the first item, actually I think the, the, the people have already left other than Trent. Is anyone here in relation to 5.9? Potentially. Oh, they're talking. Okay. All right. Well, what we will do then is we'll go to. Um, okay. I was actually. Um, going to bring forward 5.9 but I believe that the lady who asked questions has left. So we'll go to 5.5 .5, which is 120 and 122 Summer Street, Perth proposed for three storey group dwelling. Um, I have a financial interest on this matter so I will ask the Deputy Mayor to come and chair in my absence. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, any questions on this? Councillor Hallett. Um, I guess one was um, just relation to the one from the public gallery about um, the tree on the adjacent property and branches. Um, and then I've also got a question about the mature tree that's on the lot. Um, and it was noted in the response to an objection about that tree being removed that the applicant might be able to look at possibilities for retaining it and just wondering whether we... Um, would get any information on that before next week um, and then in addition what capacity is there to require that the landscaping plan includes mature trees rather than you know if it does have to be removed yes through the deputy mayor um, in relation to the first question the the development is about four meters from the boundary so in it falls the um, proposed building itself um, falls outside of the canopy area of the tree. So um, I think with appropriate um, building works, there, there shouldn't be any impact on those trees on the adjoining properties. Um, however, that is certainly something that the neighbours will need to discuss with the applicant. They'll have an obligation under the Building Act to ensure that their development doesn't affect the private property. So they will have an obligation to ensure that whatever they're doing isn't going to um, kill that tree. Um, and that is a, a private matter between um, the two landowners, or the builder and the, and the landowner. In relation to the tree on um, the subject site, the, the applicant has, the builder has said um, that they were, that they will look to try and retain the tree if possible. It's certainly not part of this development application. They haven't proposed to retain it. There's still question marks from their perspective around whether they can or they can't, and they, um, they haven't committed to doing that at all as part of this application. So um, there isn't sufficient information at this point um, about whether it will or won't be retained. That's something the applicant will determine through the process. In any case, they've met the um, landscaping requirements that the city has. So. Um, we haven't recommended that it be a requirement of the approval. Anything further, Councillor Hallett? Any other questions, Councillor Loden? Uh, just to follow up to the, the tree question. Um, so as, as it stands now, that property owner would have the right to cut any branches that are overhanging the fence, and that is the case now and also into the future, um, whether this development application is in place or not. Is that correct? Yes, through the Deputy Mayor, that's correct. But then they wouldn't have any ability to impact anything that is not on their boundary? Yes, through the Deputy Mayor, that's correct. So under the local law um, and the Local Government Act, the, the applicant would be able to cut back limbs that are hanging over their property, but um, as a part of the development itself and the construction works, they wouldn't be able to damage um, the parts of the tree that occur on that land without the owner's consent. 
And then my second question was just, uh, I'm pretty sure it's 73% hard stand, but there is a reference on page 123 that says that it's 75% landscaping. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, yeah, so I'll have to take that on notice um, and find those references and make sure that they're correct. We'll put that in the briefing notes and update the report if, um, if it's required. Anything further? Um, I just had one, and I've left my iPad down there, so I might have to go and get it. Um, just in relation to, I think it was page 145 and 146, there seem to be two different responses, technical offers for responses. Oh, thank you, Tim. Um, just there was two um, no, I'm going to find a struggle so um, there was a summary of submissions on page 145 and then on 146 there was also another summary of submissions that had two pages um, and I just was wondering if that was a duplication, because this assessment on visual privacy seemed to be quite different. Yes, uh, one of those is the applicant's response to submissions and one of those is administration's. Um, I can tell you which one, I just need to go to the... That's fine, thank you. And then I just had a follow-up in relation, it was in relation to that as well, just in terms of the visual privacy um, on that, um, on the western boundary, um, just that the, the interaction, I guess, between screening to ensure that the visual privacy is met and then um, also, I guess, the impact, potential impact on the sort of, I guess, articulation to, um, you know, make sure that um, the, the bulk of the building is not um, uh, overly impactful. Um, just, I guess, just for some advice as to how those two um, elements can um, successfully interact. Yes, through, through Deputy Mayor, the, um, the conditions have been worded deliberately to allow um, either screening or the modification of um, the opening itself. So it doesn't necessarily need to have screening there, which may add to the bulk. It might be um, that the, the glazing of the window is changed so that that doesn't impact um, the perception of bulk or the amenity of that um, facade to that um, boundary. I think it depends on the context and so we've worded that condition so that we can work with the applicant through that issue and make sure we address both um, outcomes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further? Okay, I think we'll move on. Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, we will now go to item 5.4, which is number 34, Cleaver Street, West Perth, proposed for group dwellings. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the um, Director of Development Services. Um, am I correct that both neighbouring properties supported the application? Through you, Mayor Cole, one certainly did. Um, the other property is um, a strata complex, and so I can't comment on whether um, there was support from one or more. Um, I can provide that in the briefing notes, though. Um, and just in relation to the objection um, which relates to that property um, about solar access and overshadowing, can you confirm that? because that aspect of the development is compliant with clause 5.4.2 of the R code, that it's not a feasible reason for refusal anyway? Sri Mayor Cole, that's um, correct to a degree, so it wouldn't be a reason for refusal on its own. If the setbacks were creating an issue, however, um, overshadowing is um, a, a reason um, or a requirement addressing the overshadowing issues is something that needs to be looked at as part of any setback variation. I think there is a setback variation to that boundary. However, um, on assessment, we consider that the overshadowing falls over um, the buildings themselves on that 
on that adjoining lot, on that strata development, um, and that the, because of the way the building has been split in two with that internal courtyard, um, it's actually maximised the amount of light um, that's getting to those courtyards of the strata development, the internal um, open space areas. Um, so we actually think it's been designed um, better than a deemed to comply proposal would be, could potentially be. Um, so it's actually probably creating more light to that space than um, a compliant development could be designed to do. Any further questions in relation to 5.4? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the Director of Development Services. Is there a bus stop right out the front? And if there is, how does that manage with the crossovers? Just the picture, it looked as though there was. Um, I could be wrong. There may be a bus stop there. I'd have to take that on notice. I I, I have not seen I've been out to site a couple of times. I haven't seen it, but I'll, um, I'll take it on notice and provide it to make sure that there's no issue with the crossover. If there is, the bus stop would need to be moved, but we'll, um, and that will be the applicant's response. But we'll, we'll um, look into that. And just one further. Um, so I note that the, applicant, uh, that the development provides eight residential bays, but it doesn't provide a visitor bay. Um, it just... That didn't seem to be sort of ref um, referenced in the assessment of parking and access, I don't think, in terms of the words. So it would be just good to sort of have that there to draw everybody's attention to it. Thanks. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. We'll, we'll certainly add that just to um, clarify that there's no requirement for visitor bays because it's a group dwelling development. So it's on the fifth dwelling um, that... Uh, visitor bays would be required. If it was a multiple dwelling proposal, there would be visitor bays required, um, but it's not, and so different standards apply under the R codes. But we'll set that out in any case in the, um, in the report. Any further questions on this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky, you're still thinking about... No, you've moved on. OK, great. Well, we will then move on and we'll go back to the beginning of the um, reports and uh, start with 5.1, which is number 4 of 190 Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne, change of use from recreational facility to unlisted use, non-medical consulting rooms. Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the Director of Development Services. Did the previously approved use on that site... Um, that also had a parking shortfall, pay any cash in lieu? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, no. Um, we have no record of cash in lieu being paid for that property originally. Councillors, Councillor Lowden. Uh, a couple of questions, but on that same topic, um, what was the car park calculation for the the gym that was previously there. I can provide that in the briefing notes. Um, it was a change of use application that was determined under delegated authority. Um, I have, I did have a look at the car parking calculation and um, it was assessed for the whole building, not for the individual tenancy. So our approach in this instance, and I think the appropriate approach is to assess the individual tenancy, how many bays that tenancy has um, versus how many bays are required, which has led to the, um, the numbers and the recommendation um, in this report. The reason I say that is because we've take, that's the conservative approach to take to ensure that we, we're not missing any um, variations and that discretion is being applied um, in every case, and we're not missing some instances. It could be argued that an assessment could be done for the whole development, like it was last time, which found no shortfall in parking. Um, so I just point that out. We can provide that. We will provide that in the briefing notes. So just um, there are some complexities to the to the way the parking assessments have been done historically. Uh, then my other two questions. The first one was. Um, uh, to my understanding, we can't condition uh, that the staff use public transport, so is the parking management plan the mechanism by which we're ensuring that the parking is used by customers only? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. So those bays will be required, that bay will be required to be left free for customers, and that's quite a simple thing for the city to um, enforce through compliance. Um, there's obviously also the other two visitor bays for the site, which um, the original approval required to be maintained for visitors. So really there's those three bays 
um, which we think is sufficient for the development. As a result, the um, employees won't be able to drive and park on the site. Um, they'll have to make alternative arrangements to, um, to come to the premises. And there's, um, there is long-term bicycle facilities, there's showers and change rooms, so end-of-trip facilities, and we think that that's appropriate. Um, and the applicant's certainly willing um, and, and been keen to manage the parking and the employees arriving at site in that way, so um, we're confident that it's an appropriate approach. And then the last one was this has got a 12-month condition that it then needs to come back. Does Council have discretion to waive that 12-month clause if they so wish? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Council has discretion to waive that. Uh, that's a re one of the requirements or the standards in the City's policy, um, so we've recommended that it be applied in this instance, um, particularly given the parking situation and the shortfall, and um, it also allows an opportunity to review that and whether there are any compliance issues with staff parking in the street or um, those that visitor bay being used by staff, etc. So there is an opportunity there to manage and maintain, sort of monitor the parking to make sure it's being managed appropriately. So just following up on that, so um, uh, administration wouldn't recommend waiving the 12-month clause then? Not, not in this instance, no. Councillors, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, just the car bay is at the rear of the development, is that correct? That's correct. It's accessed off the secondary street. I can't remember what the street's called now. Uh, Matlock Street. So, And there's no gate, so it's directly accessed off Matlock Street. And how will customers be alerted to the existence of the car bay? Through you, Mayor Cole, that will need to be set out in the management plan as well. Um, customers will need to be advised on appointment when they make their appointment that the parking is at the rear of the property and um, parking shouldn't be occurring on the, on the major roads. And, and so the plan is that that parking management plan will be forthcoming after the approval? Or is it in draft form now or available now? Through Mayor Cole, we don't have a draft from the applicant. Um, it's, it is a condition of a recommended condition and it would be provided after approval if that, that's the current proposal. Um, Director of Development Services through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I just, do we have an indication of how many similar businesses are already located within the Mount Hawthorne Town Centre? Through you, Mayor Cole, I couldn't give you a figure. I know that there are other um, recreation centres. Uh, sorry, um, there are other recreation centres and other um, massage premises in the vicinity, but I, I don't have an exact number. Um, can we actually uh, get some indication of that um, so that uh, I think when we actually relate back to um, uh, cities, uh, uh, our strategic plans for diversity of businesses in our town centres, I would hope that we're um, thinking about ensuring that um, we don't have a predominance of one type of business over another. Through Mayor Cole, we can provide that in the briefing notes. Councillors? I've just got a second question. Uh, just with regards to um, the number of submissions received on two lots of um, advertising, um, is it usual for us to receive no submissions on, on two um, uh, advertising procedures relatively close together? Through you, Mayor Cole, it is quite common that where um, those consulted with have no um, concerns, um, that we don't receive submissions, even if it's advertised um, more than once. Um, it's quite common that we'll receive no objections or no comments will be received. Council members, um, Director, I do have a couple of questions. I just wanted to ask that given that LPS2 is now actually imminent, um, I note that this would be um, the use would be a shop and a P use under LPS2. Um, what impact would that have on the 12 month approval? Would the policy requirements still stand and work um, with that P and shop use? And also would there be any revision to the car parking calculation with the um, shop use? 
guess um, through you, Mayor Cole, the the P use um, P uses are exempt um, under the new scheme where they comply with all of the city's policy requirements. In this case, the parking um, still wouldn't comply with the parking requirements. The parking requirement would actually be less under the shop use. You go down to about one and a half bays. Um, I think a one and a half bay shortfall. Um, and so a development approval would still be required. Uh, discretion would still be need, need to be exercised in relation to the land use um, and that car parking shortfall. But it would change the calculation slightly. Um, well, almost half of what the shortfall is. Yeah, that's. Um, is it possible to include that information in the report, given that LPS2 is literally just around the corner? Um, and also in relation to the three visitor bays for the um, entire um, property, is there consideration given to a, a portion of those three visitor bays being attributed to this particular tenancy or is the three visitor bays considered to be external to allocation to each of the individual tenancies? Yes, Sri Mayor Cole. They're, as far as I'm aware, they're considered to be external to this development application and, and this property, so they don't have any rights over that, um, over those two visitor bays. Uh, but I'll need to confirm that and put that in the briefing notes. It may be that it's just common property and all of the tenancies have rights to access those two bays. Um, however, being conservative, we've calculated the car parking based on what they have exclusive access to, um, noting that those two bays, at the very least, would be able to be accessed by all of the tenancies. But we'll put that in the briefing notes. Thank you. Any further questions on 5.1? No? OK, we'll move on to 5.2. Numbers 103 to 107, Edward Street, Perth. Change of use from warehouse to place of public worship and warehouse. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Development Services Director. Um, in relation to the condition about restricting Monday and Saturday opening hours, I know that's requested by the applicant, but just wondering whether that we have to have a condition saying they can't use the property for two days a week? Through you, Mayor Cole, there's certainly no requirement. That's what the applicant applied for. That's what was advertised to the surrounding neighbours. Um, and on that basis, we've recommended that be conditioned. It is um, very similar to what was approved um, on a separate site by the same operator. Um, and that development didn't go ahead and they've, they're now pursuing this site. And given the hours of use, um, at what point does this site stop being a warehouse um, and just solely a church? Through you, Mayor Cole, it won't stop being a warehouse in the portion of the building that is warehouse, and the other portion will be place of public worship again um, permanently. So they've separated the two spaces out and they've illustrated them on the plans which parts are which. So. It's a permanent approval for those two uses. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, uh, to um, the uh, director. Um, just, is the applicant actually currently operating um, any businesses within the city of Vincent or uh, nearby in the city of Perth? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'm not certain of that. I'll have to check. Um, I recall that they, at the last the last time we considered this, that they mentioned they were operating another um, church elsewhere. But I'll check and provide that in the briefing notes as well. Councillors, um, director, I was slightly baffled by the car parking calculation. I'm wondering if we could go through it. Um, so I talked about the fact that. 22.55 bays are required and nine are provided with a 13.55 shortfall. But then on page um, 27 of the report, it talks about the fact that the warehouse function from Tuesday to Friday actually has a two car bay surplus. The place of public worship on Thursday has a six car bay surplus. And the shortfall is on Sunday where 16 car bays are required, but there's a seven car bay shortfall. So I couldn't actually work out how that resulted in a 
13.55 car bay shortage. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. That's an error in the table on page 27. I think that's a copy and paste from the previous report. So that should say 22.5, but we will check that and update it in the report. My apologies for that error. So the table should read that the parking requirement on a Sunday is 22.55, so that the shortfall is for that period of time from 9 to 12.30 only on the, short, on the Sunday. Right, okay. That makes more sense. Thank you. Um, the other question I had, oh no, that's, that's pretty well outlined in the report actually. Um, are there any further questions on the place of worship? No, okay, thank you. Item 5.3, number 45 of 87 Ball Street, Perth, proposed amendment to operating hours of previous approval, change of use from office to eating house. Any questions? Councillor Hallett? Um, is there a reason we've included the condition that it not be opened on public holidays? Is that mandatory? Through you, Mayor Cole, that was included in the previous approval. So the close on public holidays was a requirement under the previous approval. And um, it's not set out in the policy, though. It's just to be consistent, the applicant has applied for um, the 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Monday to Sunday, but has not applied for the public holidays. Um, do we have other businesses that have that open on Sunday but not on public holidays? Because I know we've approved a few um, more likely bars, but to, if they have the same opening hours on Sundays and public holidays. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we certainly do have other premises that are eating houses, small bars, that are open on public holidays. There's some different um, conditions depending on the situation. Um, in this case, it was simply based on the fact that the original approval by council restricted the public holiday eating hours, um, and we saw no reason to change that. Um, and we weren't certain as to the debate and the discussion that occurred around that issue at the time. Um, and are, are we aware of any intention by the applicant to apply for a liquor licence in the future? I'm certainly not aware through you, Mayor Cole, but I can take that on notice and check with the officers and provide that in the briefing note. Councillor Lowden, then Councillor Patakis. I just wanted to clarify, on page 47 uh, in the table, it shows that we require council discretion for land use but not require it for the opening hours. Is that flipped around the wrong way? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the operating hours set out in the, the licensed premises policy, the city's licensed premises policy, state that um, eating houses, restaurants, um, don't have any limit on operating hours as set out in the policy. There's no standard for operating hours. Um, and on that basis, it was considered to be deemed to comply, um, while the land use is a discretionary use. But haven't we, hasn't Council already previously approved the land use? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Land use has been previously approved, but it's still a, it still remains a discretionary use. Um, this application is not proposing a new land use, so there's um, no discretion there as such, but it is important to understand that it's a discretionary use and um, the conditions around that, well, there's, there is additional or a different approach can be taken to the conditions that occur around that land use. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, to the Director. Um, it's just regarding um, operating hours and just following on from um, Councillor Hallett. Um, I do sort of recall that we've had a few approvals where the Sunday prior to the Monday public holiday we've allowed an extended um, time of opening. Um, is there provision within this for us to actually consider that only on us, um, seeing that the applicants applied for um, a closure up until 12am um, that just on public Sundays before public holidays we can entertain? Yes, through you Mayor Cole. The, the reason we've recommended a 10pm closure is because of the potential impact this premises has on the residential properties above as opposed to um, the broader area. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend um, allowing additional operating hours before a public holiday or before a um, 
on a Saturday night or a Friday night simply because um, it does have the potential. Um, there weren't any noise um, measures implemented into the, the ground floor of, sorry, the first floor of the building to protect the residential apartments above. Um, and so I wouldn't recommend allowing additional operating hours um, because there's still that potential to have the impact on those residents above, um, even if it's before a public holiday. Any further questions, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Uh, just following on again, um, if, is there the potential for those sorts of measures to be met through retrospective implementation of noise dampening? And so is that the sort of thing that could come back to us? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we did ask the applicant for a noise um, study, an acoustic report, um, and for them to set out what kind of measures they, or if they could, um, apply measures to allow them to operate further. They, um, we, we consider that they you know, the health officers have looked at the building plans and have looked at the proposal, um, and it, there didn't seem to be any viable option from our perspective. The applicant didn't come back to us with a noise report, and so um, given those two factors, we've recommended the conditions that we've recommended. It is possible um, that the condition three in relation to the acoustic report could be combined with the amended condition one and set out that additional hours would be permitted under the scenario that acoustic measures are implemented to make the development comply with the noise regulations. Um, so that is, that is an option for council to consider, um, but given we don't think it's a, a realistic option for the developer because of the cost of implementing those measures into the, into the roof or into the ceiling of the tenancy. Um, and given the strata restrictions, because it's a strata building, um, we think it's simpler just to make it clear what the operating hours should be now. Any further questions on this item? OK, thank you. Um, we've dealt with items 5.4 and 5.5, .5, which were raised by members of the public gallery. So we move on to item 5.6, number 18, Scarborough Beach Road, North Perth, proposed change of use from warehouse to recreational facility. Councillor Lowden. Uh, just a query on, it, is this currently an operating recreation, is it currently operating as a recreational facility now? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. It has been operating for about a year. And with that being the case, is this then not a retrospective application? Or? Through you, Mayor Cole, the, applicant, the application was lodged before they commenced operating, so it wasn't a retrospective application at the time. Um, SAT's made some recent, or a recent decision about um, three or four months ago that um, technically there is no um, difference between an application that's made for a development that's already commenced and an application that's made for a, a development that hasn't yet commenced. And so um, we have stopped using that um, terminology in the reports because um, the SAT has made it clear that there should be no difference in how the two proposals are treated. So that was the rationale for not, we don't refer to that retrospective. We, we definitely refer to in the report whether it's occurred, or, uh, it's happened or not, um, but it's no longer, the terminology of retrospective is no longer used. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, just uh, a query in relation to the other properties across, I guess, Sydney Street and in the adjacent area as to what their treatment in, is under um, TPS2, um, just in relation to how um, development of that site might impact on the availability of um, on-street parking for over the life of this development? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. I'll have to take it on notice what I did have a look, but I can't remember yeah i can't I, mean, I won't speculate what the proposal or what the, the zoning is across the road um, given the development's already operating and the, there's a strata development directly across Sydney Road um, that is unlikely to be redeveloped in the near term. We didn't think that there was going to be any significant impact as a result of this development, particularly given it's been operating for a year and the surveys were undertaken and showed that there was actually plenty of capacity now um, for an additional development of this scale or bigger to rely completely on the road. So we're comfortable there's still plenty of capacity in the road reserve for parking 
even if redevelopments occurred. But but I'll ex set out what the um, the zoning is under TPS two. Um, Director, I just wanted to follow up on that question. That was something that I had um, written here that. The report talks about significant surplus of on-street parking. Um, given that there are bike lanes and it is a development corridor, there will be some future needs along there, and I'm wondering whether there was consideration given to a parking management plan with a review at a certain point in time, as has been done with some of the places of worship that Council's um, recently considered. So that was the first question. And the second question was the report talks about the number of staff and customers um, at, at uh, clause 1.3 it talks about three staff and 26 customers then 1.4 talks about 35 members and then further through the report it talks about two staff so um, I just think there might be um, a need to be consistent across the numbers and um, some clarification about what is actually being sought um, for approval. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The reference to the 26 patrons uh, on the site at any one time um, is specific to that condition. The 35 members is a, a different requirement altogether um, to ensure that they don't create a situation where they have to turn people away, what's likely that they're going to have to turn people away. So that's a, a membership restriction versus a number of people on or patrons on the site at any one time. The three staff and two staff. Um, I think that, well, the three staff is the correct number. I think the two staff comes from the the very first point of the applicant um, applying, but I'll, we'll correct that in the report. They've changed it to three, so it should be three. Um, in relation to a parking management plan, we didn't think that it was, um, that we could achieve a lot through a parking management plan, um, given, we, we could certainly achieve something for the staff. Um, there's no doubt about that. But we couldn't achieve a lot for the, the majority of the people attending the site are the patrons. Um, and because there's no on-site parking, it's very difficult to manage their parking in the same way as a place of worship, where on a Sunday morning you can have people pointing to the correct place to park, don't park out front of the residential properties, etc. Um, but there's certainly some opportunity to educate um, those attending the site that there's limited parking and that they should ride or walk where they can and catch public transport. So there is an opportunity for that. Um, we'll have a look at that through the, um, well, between now and the council meeting and provide some information in the briefing notes and potentially put a condition in there um, to address at least those issues, the staff and educating the patrons, because I think that would certainly help um, and ensure that there aren't going to be um, greater issues than we've seen as part of the parking surveys. Thank you. Just um, now that I have a good understanding of what the difference is between members and customers on site at one time, it does strike me that if they can have a maximum of 26 customers but only 35 members, that's relying on all members to be pretty highly active. And I'm just wondering, um, is that something that the applicant agreed to? Because I'm, if you looked at gym membership across certain facilities, actually the acting CEO is probably well placed to understand this. I would imagine that... Um, that that's not a, you know, that's a very high ratio of active members from 35. That seems to be quite a tough bar to be set. Is that being agreed by the applicant? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. That was the applicant's proposal, the 35 and the 26. Um, but I, I did have the same thought when I saw that. I had assumed that the applicant, or, and, and that this premises was just had quite a high rate. But I think we'll go back and speak to the applicant about it again, just to confirm that they um, are confident that this is the appropriate ratio. Because the membership number is, it's, a, it's about setting a realistic number that's not going to lead to turnaways. And um, yeah, we'll have a chat with them about the details of their proposal. But it certainly was their, um, their proposal to limit those two numbers in that way. Thank you. Well, given that they're operating, it would be good to ask them how many members they currently have and what their maximum capacity is that they're currently experiencing. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Castle? Through you, Mayor, to the, uh, to the Director. Well, was any consideration given to acoustic uh, issues with the, with the business? Have there been any complaints or discussions about that, particularly given that the operating hours are from 5am? 
Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we haven't received any complaints. I'd have to take on notice um, whether they provided any acoustic reporting at the time of the application. It's certainly not referred to in the report. Um, so I don't think they did. And given the commercial buildings that immediately surround them um, and the lack of complaints, and there's, there's no policy requirement for it in this instance because of those two, well, because of the, the commercial zoning. Um, but I'll, I'll ask the staff again and we'll liaise with the applicant to determine whether uh, what treatments they've put into the building. Um, they certainly have the doors closed when they're operating. Um, so if they've treated the building appropriately, there wouldn't be any impact from the noise. And just to follow on from that, is the entirety of the business conducted on the property? Or is it um, a, one of those personal trainer situations where they run around the block and make noise in their vicinity? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. My understanding is that it's con entirely contained on the site, but whether they... In, they may well um, have that practice of leaving the premises and, and running around the block, so I'll um, again ask the applicant to confirm that. We haven't had any complaints about that either, though. Councillors, any further questions on the um, recreational facility? Okay, thank you. The next item is 5.7, late report. Number 48, Milton Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed five group dwellings. No questions on this item, Councillor Loden? Just a quick one. Uh, looking at the map on page 14 of the late report, um, it appears that the majority of the street are all three, there seems to be three dwellings or single dwelling properties. I was just wondering if you could confirm um, what the, the predominant thing is in the streetscape? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The predominant development is grouped dwellings um, on the streetscape. And are they, is it primarily three, develop, three group dwellings on each of those blocks of land? It, it depends, through you, Mayor Cole, that there's two group dwellings, three group dwellings. Um, I think there's a six as well in there. Um, yeah, so it varies. But the majority of the developments on the street are um, group dwellings. Councillors, any further questions? Um, Director, I just wanted to ask, um, given that this has come forward as a late item and it's a recommendation of refusal, has the applicant given any further consideration to making changes in light of this recommendation or what, what's their sort of perspective on, on the matter? I note that they did not wish to engage with the DAC. I think that was this one, yes. Um, but they did make some changes, is there any willingness for them to consider further changes now that the recommendation has been made public? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the applicant has made changes on a number of occasions in an attempt to address the city's concerns, the officer's concerns, as well as um, the, the DAC's comments. Um, the last set of plans was received um, about the middle of last week, and that was the reason why the report was late, because we needed to assess those revised plans. Um, but all they did was change the material or materiality of the development. They didn't change the, the structure and um, particularly the outdoor um, living areas. Um, and so the applicant is aware of the, the recommendation um, and they haven't chosen to um, seek to make any further changes. Um, they certainly made it clear that they um, weren't willing to change the um, the floor plan and the, the layout any further. Thank you, Director. Any further questions on Milton Street? No? Okay. The next item is um, the 5.8, Submission on Welga Draft Climate Change Policy Statement. Questions? No questions? Um, I have a question. Um, is this to yourself, Director, or to uh, Manager of Policy in Place? Okay. Um, I just wondered, I felt um, when I read the policy statement that there was a significant inf um, emphasis on state government rather than federal government. And given that federal government 
is really responsible for agreeing targets and international and UN negotiations and dealing with climate change at a global impact. Was any consideration given to the um, what seemed to be a strong emphasis on state government rather than federal government or Commonwealth government in the Welga policy statement? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we haven't discussed that, um, and so we can have a look into that issue and provide some comments in the report. I think it's appropriate. Um, it's a good point. Thank you. Well, look, that did come through quite strongly for me, so I'll see what comes back through the briefing notes, but otherwise I might um, just foreshadow an amendment to strengthen um, the fact that I think that the, fed, the response of the federal government is quite critical, and I believe that's underplayed in the Welga submission. Any further questions? Okay, moving on to item 5.9, amendment to policy number 7.5.15, character retention areas and heritage areas. And we did have a member of the public gallery here tonight asking questions on this item. Any questions? Councillor Loden. Um, I'll just put forward the questions that the member of the gallery raised and hopefully they're watching at home. Um, so just the three questions that I picked were um, that given that the majority of people on Janet Street did not support heritage retention or character retention, why was administration recommending uh, that, uh, sorry, character, oh, sorry, heritage retention? Um, can you explain the process that went through the consultation that occurred um, and why does the city not consider property values in the process of uh, character or heritage retention? Through you, sorry. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, in relation to why the city um, proposed the heritage area for Janet Street in initially, um, although the street has a relatively basic design, which was pointed out during the public question time, um, it has a lot of historical value because it's a very intact example um, and representation of the. Um, 1920s style development on the northern side of the street, um, lots of federation architecture, and on the southern side it's that interwar period. Um, so for that reason um, the, the area was considered appropriate for um, heritage listing. Um, during the consultation period the city um, didn't receive any objections or um, additional information that would question the, that, the validity of that initial heritage area assessment. Um, and so that hasn't changed from when Council adopted the advertised version of the policy to now. Um, and on that basis, um, we believe that there's no, no reason to, to downgrade that area. Um, the proposal is also really seeking to um, ensure that future development is sensitive to that existing streetscape. Um, although there's, there's um, two developments on the corner of Charles Street and one in the middle of the street that are um, you know, clearly a lot more modern and have been developed um, you know, since the original dwellings were there, um, it kind of exacerbates the reason and the importance for having this area um, protected from a cultural and historical heritage point of view. Um, in terms of the process that has been undertaken, so um, the city received the nomination for the character retention area back in March 2016, and at the time um, there was indicated 47% of landowners um, and residents on the street were supportive of that proposal. Um, we held workshops with the, the landowners in June 2016 and again in April 2017 um, to ensure that the process was um, transparent and, and ideally being driven by the community. Um, however, it got to a point in that process with the community that we felt it was appropriate to bring a, a proposal to council and um, undertake formal consultation to make sure that um, we were progressing the project um, and not just having lots of chats with the local community about doing something. Um, so the proposal was put together um, in conjunction with the community with the provisions focusing on um, really ensuring that future development in the area is, is sensitive to the existing development. Um, and that's what was put forward um, through the formal consultation period. 
um, we advertised it for um, a, a significantly longer period than, than required because it was over the Christmas and New Year period and went above the statutory requirements by having walking meetings um, out on the streets with the residents to make sure that we um, really understood the, all of the residents' views. Um, in addition to that, um, because we were advertising the heritage area in the local planning policy, um, that was the focus of our initial consultation. Um, because we got some mixed responses to that, we wanted to make sure we fully understood the community's views on heritage and or character um, and where they sat for either of those options. So we did um, additional consultation with the local community to understand how they felt on character. Um, so in that regard, I feel the process has been really quite rigorous and we have a very good understanding of, of what, where the community sits on, on heritage and character. Um, and nonetheless, despite the, um, I guess, f sort of 50-50 split, um, based on our heritage assessment and our um, views on the cultural and historic value of those in, in the built environment in that area. We feel that it's really important that, um, that we protect that area from um, future development that maybe isn't sensitive to the, to the development that's there now. Um, in terms of the, the last question around the, um, the value, impact on property values or, or personal value um, for people, um, and the reason why that is not considered to be a, a valid planning consideration. Um, when we're looking at planning considerations, they're things that impact on the built environment rather than um, you know, financial gains or losses for any individual person. Um, so from a planning perspective, we're really looking at um, the impact that this policy will have on the built environment and the type of development in the area um, as opposed to any impact um, on a Per individual person's financial um, interests. Um, can I just follow up? That was really excellent information. I'm just wondering if you could perhaps add that detail to the report that comes to Council on uh, Tuesday because that doesn't seem to be well understood, um, particularly um, with the uh, member of the public who attended today. I don't think that level of information um, was perhaps made available and that that would actually really help to explain the level of consultation that's happened? Sorry, through you, Mayor Cole, I can also speak with that, um, the person who was in the gallery tonight and make sure that they're across that, the, the commentary that I provided. Thank you. Um, further questions? Councillor Castle and then Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor, a, a question in relation to the submissions that you received. Can you tell us if it may be in the report, what proportion of the landowners does that represent? So 16 submissions, do you feel that that's a good number um, of responses for the number of landowners there are? And are any of those a double up on property or is it one submission per property? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, in terms of the number of submissions, I think that it, um, we sort of covered quite comprehensively the street. Um, I think there's about 18 properties that are affected by the, the area. Excuse me. <coughs> um, I, can, I can get a breakdown of the representation um, in terms of households. I know there were a couple that, um, that were, you know, a, a, two people own a property and both people made submissions that were very um, very similar. So I can check that for you and, and provide that in the briefing notes and update the report if necessary. Um, just some more follow-ups, sorry. Um, just in relation to those submissions, um, do we have detail whether they're the landowners versus um, just tenants that are um, submitting either way? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, I, it's a, a combination of the two. Um, I can provide a breakdown of that as well in the briefing notes. Um, could you also just comment on um, the heritage assessment that we've done and how the, the comment from the public gallery about the level of modification to properties that's occurred over the years and to what extent that detracts from any historical value that the, the buildings have? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. So there are a number of properties on the street that have um, have had some modifications undertaken. Um, 
a couple of them are um, modifications that impact on the front facade to this to the street um, and others are like inside the the actual dwellings or at the rear of the the properties um, in terms of the from a heritage perspective um, the facade of the development is what has the in, in most instances is what has the highest value and certainly in this instance um, it's it's really about the st the streetscape and the intactness of the streetscape that provides that um, really good example of um, that style of that era of development. Um, and so in this instance, although there has been some minor modifications, um, ma majority of the properties on the street, they still have their original facades, um, they have their original setbacks, um, most of them have the original verandas, although some of the veranda treatments have been modified to a, a different style um, that's got the same depth and the same plate height and for that reason um, the, the streetscape still appears to be moderately intact and I think a, a lot of the modifications that have happened um, you know, are, are sort of behind that setback area. Just the last one. Um, do we have any information about, I guess, other uh, areas in Vincent that have been designated heritage um, and the level of support? So what is the ratio that we've kind of deemed, you know, if there's opposition um, and we're having to balance that level? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I th probably the most recent example would be the Harley Street heritage area, um, and that area had a significant amount of support, um, you know, to in terms of proposing the heritage area. Um, from a council decision perspective, um, notwithstanding the varied viewpoints from the community, um, it's completely at council's discretion to determine whether a heritage area is appropriate or not. Um, both based on the assessment um, and the planning grounds in the submissions. Um, can I just follow up on that, um, Manager for Policy in Place? In relation to the 47% that um, supported the nomination in the first place, is it possible to look at whether those, um, whether they were tenants or landowners are still tenants and landowners of Janet Street? Because that question has been raised um, in the public gallery tonight. Also, I'm just wondering if there is a more detailed um, level of heritage assessment that could be made available in the report or as an attachment, um, given that that has also been queried about the, um, the, the depth and integrity of the heritage assessment. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the city um, engaged a heritage consultant a number of years ago to undertake heritage assessments of a number of different areas in the city, um, and that report formed the basis of the, the heritage assessment that has been uh, more recently undertaken by the city's officers. So I can provide some additional information in the report and briefing notes. Thank you. And... Um I just wanted to also ask about the difference um, and the benefit between a heritage area versus a character retention area for residents of Janet Street. Through you, Mayor Cole, the, um, the key, there's a few key differences between a heritage and a character area. So um, I guess that the fundamental component of, of both um, designations is that we put in place specific policy provisions to guide future development that's um, unique and bespoke to that location. So that's things like um, the, the setbacks and the um, treatments on their facades and, and different things like that. The main difference then is that um, with a heritage area, they will require approval to demolish their um, their building. So at the moment, um, with the current state regulation, uh, with a character area, they wouldn't be required to submit a development approval to demolish their um, their building or their dwelling. Um, but if it's designated as a heritage area, they would we would be able to um, bring that to council and, and decide whether it's appropriate for for demolition. Um, in addition to that, the city has a number of um, heritage policies that would also um, apply to that area. So um, those they cover things like. Um, how we manage that the heritage value there and make sure that it's maintained, um, how we would deal with applications for development, because um, development wouldn't be precluded if it's a heritage area. Um, it would really 
just be providing additional guidance to make sure that the heritage integrity of the place is preserved. So um, there's policies that provide additional guidance around that um, and also they would be um, capable of um, applying for our Heritage Assistance Fund, um, which is quite a good benefit for those residents if they're looking at improving their properties. Thank you, Manager. So just to clarify, it doesn't prohibit demolition. It would simply be that, there were, that you would not be able to demolish without development approval, which used to exist under the R codes, or sorry, under the planning regs up until, I think, 2015 anyway, which we're lobbying to have returned. So it would simply mean that, but as a character retention area, you can demolish without a development approval, but then your development approval would then need to meet the guidelines. Okay, thank That's you. That's correct, yeah. Thanks. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on from this item to the last development services item for the evening. You must be relieved. <laughs> um, item 5.10, outcomes of advertising town centre place plans. Any questions on this item? Place plans. Okay. We're all we're all okay with that one. Great. All right. Your grilling is over for the evening. <laughs> Thank you. You did a great job. I note that Director of Engineering has a quiet night tonight. <laughs> So we'll, we'll keep going. Corporate services, item 7.1, late report financial statements as at 31st of March 2018. Any questions on this item? Okay, no. Item 7.2, investment report as at 31st of March 2018. Questions? Councillor Loden and then Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I just wanted to check uh, uh, to find out. I've noticed that we're the, the amount of um, funds invested in non-fossil fuel banks has decreased. Um, we're obviously going to be seeing rates coming in in a few months' time. Uh, is, do you expect that we'll see an increase in the non-fossil fuel banks in the future, or are they currently uncompetitive with the other banks in their rates they're offering? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, this is an area that Corporate Services is spending a bit of time on at the moment. Um, basically what we're trying to do is interrogate further where banks are saying that their non-fossil fuel is understanding their um, investments at a more detailed level. Um, while there is a certain amount of disclosure, it's very difficult unless you can really drill into um, those particular investments to determine how compliant they are with non-fossil fuel. Um, what I would like to do is bring back to Council at some point within the next six to eight weeks an investment policy that will um, explain how we will be able to demonstrate that we are um, looking for compliant investments but also um, more ethically compliant investments generally, so broader than just non-fossil fuel. Um, I would expect that at this stage those investments will get easier to find over time and particularly as there's more transparency around the investments over time. Um, in terms of rates, look, it's just really difficult to say. We are seeing long-term cash rate is going up and um, we would expect that that would reflect in bank rates at some point. Uh, it's another reason that I think we need to bring the investment strategy as a whole back to council because it may be that we're better off at this stage um, looking at diversifying investments broader than just um, A and A uh, plus A minus uh, rated banks. Thank you, Director. Any further questions? No, okay. Um, we'll move to item 7.3, authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of March to 31st of March 2018. No, okay. Community engagement, item 8.1, asset disposal, Vincent Community Bus. Councillor Loden. Uh, two questions. Just uh, The first one is, um, would we, will we rescind the community bus policy or is that something that would happen once the bus is sold? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the intention is uh, certainly regardless of the asset disposal option that Council decides upon, there will be a subsequent report 
to council um, for a variety of reasons depending on what, what that option is but as part of that we would then formalise the disposal of the bus and revoke the policy. And then the second one was just refers to the, the email uh, acting CEO sent through earlier today about um, the potential to do a public notice instead of an auction and I just wanted to clarify what administration's view was of the benefits or otherwise of a public notice instead of an auction. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, it's certainly acknowledged by administration that the, the, the public option, a uh, public auction option, as per the Act, uh, is is based on the highest bidder, and therefore it is likely to be the most uh, advantageous approach um, from a financial return perspective. Certainly acknowledge that uh, either disposal through public tender or disposal through public notice. Um, may provide uh, Council the ability to better acknowledge uh, the contribution of, of Bendigo Bank. Uh, and, and so in that regard, uh, hence the position put forward by the Bendigo Bank Chairman to me today was that um, through the public notice process, um, the community bank feels that uh, their, uh, their gifting um, to the city of the community bus or that the funding towards the, the acquisition of the community bus can be better acknowledged. Um, so from that perspective, I can certainly appreciate the Bendigo Bank's perspective, but at this point in time, um, administration stands by its recommendation to um, proceed with public auction um, on the basis that it is most likely to give the um, best financial return for the city. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Acting CEO. Um, could you confirm whether there are cheaper options for utilising a bus um, for us than rather than maintaining our own, um, potentially for future well and wise initiatives? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, I, I can certainly confirm that and, and quite easily include that in the Council briefing notes. That was part of our assessment over the last 18 months in particular um, to look at the most cost-effective way of providing bus transport um, and it has been a large driver behind our decision making to either use external bus hire companies or um, tour companies um, as opposed to using our own community bus for well and wise activities. So I can certainly include that information in the briefing notes. Any further questions? Um, Director, I just wanted to ask, I know that there has been some conjecture over whether the bus, um, Bendigo Bank would like to pay for the bus or receive the bus for free. There is a there has been an offer of twenty thousand dollars put forward by Bendigo Bank at, at one point in this um, discussion. Um, would we be guaranteed at public tender to at least raise the twenty thousand dollars that has been offered by Bendigo Bank? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, through uh, public tender, there is um, no obligation for council to accept. Uh, the offer purely on the basis of uh, the financial value put forward. So through the public tender option, we do have the ability to consider not just um, the financial submissions, but other aspects that we may indeed include within the um, tender assessment provisions. Under the public auction um, option, um, I may just defer to the Director of Engineering um, to make sure he's paying attention, but, but also um, given his experience um, in auctioning vehicles and um, based on a conversation we had earlier this week. Uh, through you, Mayor. So um, certainly if we send it to auction, we'll get a, a fair competition. And uh, uh, we've approached auction houses in the past and they say that uh, it will be hotly contested. They believe that they'll be able to achieve a good price. So uh, if we do send it to auction, there's a good chance that we'll uh, receive more than the 20,000 that's already been bid. So. Um, is it possible to send it to auction with a reserve price of $20,000 given that there has been an offer on the table and is that something that administration would consider to be reasonable? Yes, uh, absolutely. We would set a reserve price based on a valuation. So if the uh, valuation was 20000 that's what we would expect as a minimum back. So we'd always set a reserve price based on the valuation given to us by the auction house. Thank you. Is it possible to have a confirmation of what the reserve price would be before the Tuesday Council meeting? 
and that's the conversation that uh, the acting chief executive referred to, Mayor, which was that uh, we will have that valuation before next week's council meeting, an right. up-to-date valuation. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Castle? Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, just quickly, if we go down the public notice road, um, is the option available to Council to not accept any of the tenders if we're not happy with any of the, the offers? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, Council reserves that right to not accept any of the submissions, um, at which point in time we could then uh, determine whether we want to pursue one of the other asset disposal options or an alternative course of action. Any further questions on the community bus? Okay, thank you. Um, just for an update on the um, what was due to be a late report on the petition to exempt uh, Brisbane Terrace from the new parking zone seven and a policy on parking permits that has been withdrawn and will come back on the 29th of May council agenda, which is going to be a super bumper edition. So over to Chief Executive Officer items, 9.1 information bulletin. Any questions? Councillor Hallett? Um, just in relation to, um, I think this will be to the Director of Engineering, um, in relation to the tree removal um, register, um, there was a few recent um, tree removals that were replaced with jacarandas and just wondering about the rationale for using jacarandas and how that aligns with our um, impending tree selection tool. Through you, Mayor, if you're happy, I'll take that question on notice. Any further questions, Councillor Hallett? Councillor Loden? Uh, also on the tree removal uh, register um, at 118 Vincent Street, it says that a tree was removed because it was too close to another tree because it was two metres away. I just wanted to clarify if that's like a common practice because two metres seems like a decent distance. Through your mouth, I can answer that. I believe that tree was retained because it was two metres away, but if I take that on notice, I'll check that that is the case. It just the, I think it's the way it's written, but I'll check that and get back to you in the notes if that's OK. Any further questions on the info bulletin? Councillor Gondoshevsky? Just, uh, just one quick one more on tr street tree removal. If on the occasion that um, a developer is required to plant the street trees as part of their approvals, if they um, die within a short period of time in relation to being planted, is it, whose responsibility is it for replacement? I don't I can, know who that's to. Yeah, I can answer that question through you, Mayor Cole. Um, it will depend on the condition and the wording of the condition. Um, if it's through a landscaping plan, then the applicant um, and the developer will be responsible for replacing the tree if it dies. Um, if the, if the applicant and the developer is no longer um, there, then the owners would be responsible for replacing the tree in accordance with that landscaping plan and then maintaining it in accordance with the plan. Any further questions on the info bulletin? Okay. Um, the next item is 9.2, the Australasian Management Challenge Final 2018. No questions? Everyone's happy? Fantastic, thank you. Um, we do have a, another late item which may not appear on your copy of the agenda. Um, this is a late report on the resignation of the Chief Executive Officer. Um, it has only just been provided late this afternoon, so I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to have a read through or if you'd like a few moments to scan through it now. Um, but if there are any questions, I'll take them now. Councillor Loden. Um, just wanted to clarify um, why specifically it said three council members. Um, I, I guess because previously we've had four on the um, the panel, the, the CEO review panel. Um, as I've specified in the report, there's there's no um, set number of people that um, council might want to put on this panel. The reason we've um, 
recommended three is purely because the previous time we appointed a CEO recruitment panel, there were three um, people on that panel. Uh, so it's in line with previous practice. In addition, um, an odd number on a recruitment panel is often um, a preferable outcome because that avoids a deadlocked um, decision-making process. Councillors, it's, um, it's, it's been recommended by administration, but obviously council um, is able to um, seek to amend or change if that's, if that's the will of council. Um, I'm happy to discuss with anyone any expressions of interest um, during the week if you if you want to do that, perhaps by email or um, then we can see um, what sort of level of interest we're looking at and then perhaps make some call on the numbers on the panel. Um, my only, um, I guess my only perspective on this is that it, it does need to be workable. Um, it's likely to be happening during office hours and that we'd also have a, um, a recruitment consultant as part of that sort of interview panel as well. So happy to take any feedback or comment on that now or um, during the week. Any further questions about what's being proposed in relation to um, the process? We'll note that it talks about the panel's first step would be to recommend a preferred recruitment consultant back to council for approval and to recommend a process for the selection of the CEO for endorsement by council. So that would um, require an, a further report to council. So this is quite a staged process. Councillor Hallett. Um, I guess there was some discussion previously about capacity within the HR department um, within admin. Um, I guess how strongly um, do we feel about having an external? That's a very good question which I asked the Acting CEO myself and I'll hand over to the Acting CEO to answer that question. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, through conversations with the Manager of Human Resources, um, based on her um, experience, um, she views uh, that there would be strong value in using an external recruitment company um, for, for a number of reasons, but a couple of them being their executive search um, abilities that, that extend beyond our, our own human resources department, as well as the ability to um, implement some other key aspects of an executive search, such as um, um, headhunting and, and some of those more um, specified human resources um, activities that our own human resources department, again, wouldn't necessarily um, be expert in or be resourced to undertake. Um, having said that, uh, I would certainly see, once the panel is formed, uh, the manager of human resources um, providing some specific advice and direction to the panel in the first instance, um, and that may indeed um, change the perspective on that, but certainly based on the initial advice from the manager, it was that a use of a recruitment consultant is, is the preferred um, way to go. Through you, Mayor, uh, just a question. Would you envisage this panel would interact with Council in a similar way to um, how we've seen the appointments of directors recently, where um, basically when it comes back to Council there's already one preferred candidate? or would So that process is all going to happen at panel level? before it comes, I know there's stages there to review the contract, um, but in terms of selection of the candidate, that that's really going to happen at the panel level. Are you asking myself that question? Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, that is typically how a recruitment panel would work, um, particularly given they'd have the insight of um, being there at the interview to be able to make that decision. However, um, Council is free to set out whatever process it deems appropriate for the appointment of the CEO, and um, so that can be, uh, that needs to be approved by Council, and they can set out whatever process they see fit. Um, just from my perspective, um, if there were two um, candidates that were on par with one another and the, and, the, and the panel couldn't decide, then you might have a situation where you actually present those options. But um, as Tim, uh, sorry, Manager for Governance 
has suggested often in these situations you are trying to angle to, to bring forward one preferred candidate. Um, I note that there would be a high level of interest from all of Council because this is a very significant appointment and it might be possible to arrange for Council to meet the preferred candidate in a more informal situation um, rather than simply pre being presented to a council meeting. That might be something that could also be considered and, and discussed by, by the panel and brought back to council um, as part of the methodology that's adopted. Any further questions on this item? Okay, thank you. Um, that concludes our reports um, before we move behind closed doors for our confidential items. So at this point um, we do have uh, two confidential items. Or oh, Sorry, CEO, Acting CEO, has 12.2 been withdrawn? Or is that...? It has. Okay. So just for the record, item 12.2 has been withdrawn at this stage. So we have one confidential item, um, which is 12.1, a late report on review of policy um, related to the Design Advisory Committee and appointment of a Design Review Panel members. So um, we'll just have to go in camera for that.